Okay, so we're just continuing our journey down the Haftorahs of Isaiah. As we mentioned many times, we are in the midst of a series of seven Haftorahs of comfort. And um, we are at the sixth. Next week is the last one before Rosh Hashanah. And here, Isaiah introduces, focuses on a new theme. Um, up till now, it was the idea Hashem, prom, God promising the people that he will <clears throat> redeem them, bring them back to Israel, bring a certain amount of, uh, of wealth to Israel, never again um, send them away, uh, reminding them that they are not, um, that, the, the, that the covenant is still intact. They were never sent away. They were never divorced, etc. Today, we have a new theme. In other words, we start introducing, Isaiah begins to introduce the concept of light. And the light is a metaphor for spiritual light. And as we will see, <clears throat> what Isaiah is telling, telling the Jewish people is that the influence of the Jewish people will spread and their moral teachings, their spiritual light will spread to the, rest of the, to the rest of the world, to the other nations as well. And that's how the, the influence will spread. And as a result, the nations of the world will see it that will see it as the fulfillment of their purpose and the fulfillment of part of their purpose of creation to support the Jewish people and the Jewish economy to the extent of actually bringing uh, gold and silver in modern day language, you would say, to the extent of bringing in investment as maybe we're seeing today. But this is another dimension that is introduced in this, in the, in this, in this week's, in this week's Haftorah. Um, <clears throat> That's the big theme. So unlike other weeks, I think we're going to go straight to the specific verses, and then we can discuss um, the meaning of the verses and the, and, the, uh, and the various interpretations. But the big idea is expressed in the first verse, in the first few verses, but also in the first verse, which is the name of the Haftorah, Kumi Ori. So I'm reading Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has shone upon you. So, in other words, that at this point, we are, we are telling the Jewish people, the prophet is telling the Jewish people that what they awaited for, which is the light of God, has shone upon them. What does that exactly mean? So... <clears throat> There is a Medrash. The Medrash says as follows. The Medrash says, once upon a time, there was a man walking at night, and he needed light, so he lit a torch. And then, for whatever reason, the torch was extinguished, the wind or whatever the circumstances were, and the torch was extinguished. And then the man lit a second torch. And then the second torch was, as well, was, was distinguished as well. So finally, the person said, you know what? I'm not going to light any more torches. Why don't I just wait for the morning? And when the morning shows up, the morning is so much more powerful than the light of the sun is so much more powerful than any light that this, this person was able to produce through his own effort, through the effort of the torch. So the Medrash makes this point when it says, Kumi Ori, wake up, shine, because your light has come and the glory of the Lord has shone upon you. That's referring to the idea that in the first two temples, the first two kingdoms that the Jewish people built, the first one with Solomon, the second one when they returned from the, from, the, from the Babylonian exile. So they're trying to create spiritual light. They're trying to create spiritual influence. And to some degree, they were successful. However, they were not successful entirely. And the light wasn't that great. And also, the light was not enduring. So the prophet says here, once the sun shines, that's the metaphor for the intense light of God, the intense light of spiritual awareness that will shine, once that happens, um, then it's a whole nother story and it will also be enduring. So that's the, fir the, first, the first point. Um, <clears throat> the, 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 in, when you're talking about the idea of the prophets, the prophets talk um, in poetic language. So sometimes they repeat themselves. And the reason why that something is repeated is like Rashi says, to beautify the prose, or to beautify the poetry. So not every repetition has to, can or has to be explained, at least on the surface reading. 
Nevertheless, the commentaries point out, or some commentaries point out, that when the prophets, when they do repeat themselves, uh, if you look carefully, you will see that it's not just a repetition, it's not just to beautify the language, there also could be an additional meaning, and this is case in point. So the first, verse one seems to be repetitive. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has shone upon you. There's the light that shines, and then there's the glory of the Lord that sh shines upon you. What's the difference between the light that shines and the glory of the Lord that shines upon you? What's the difference between the two? So the Abarbanel explains that there are two dimensions here. The first light is the light of natural salvation. In other words, the fact that the Jewish people are successful in the, in the, in the natural world. That's your light has shot, you, your, your light has come. Now, now is the time that you will be successful in the natural world. The second step is much more than just a natural success, but it's also spiritual light. And Abarbanel refers to it as light of nevuah, the light of prophecy, the light of awareness of God. So this verse, according to Abarbanel, has a double meaning. On one hand, it, it means that there's going to be a natural salvation. Maybe we'll uh, be successful in rebuilding a kingdom, maybe creating an army, maybe selling or uh, creating uh, uh, a nice economy. But that's all within the first, um, the first clause of the verse, which is your light has come. And then there's the glory of Hashem that introduces the spiritual dimension, the dimension of prophecy as a metaphor for God's awareness of God, spiritual enlightenment. Now, the next verse contrasts, contrasts the light that the Jewish people will enjoy with the darkness, with the spiritual darkness that engulfs the nations. And then eventually, verse 3, we talk about how the light of the Jewish people will eventually penetrate and affect and influence the nations of the world as well, which, as we mentioned, is one of the big ideas of this Haftorah. Not only will the Jewish people be successful in their land, not only will the nations of the world support them, but also the Jewish people will be successful in the spiritual sense. They'll have a, a uh, <clears throat> intense spiritual light, and eventually that light will influence the rest of the world as well, the rest of the nations, and that's how we move to verse 2 and verse 3. So verse 2 reads, For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and a gross darkness the kingdoms, and the Lord shall shine upon you, and his glory shall appear over you. So we're talking about the contrast, that while there is a spiritual darkness um, um, covering all other nations, the Jewish people have the light because the light of God shines upon the Jewish people. But again, the point is not that the light should remain exclusively in the domain of the Jewish people. So that's what verse 3 continues, and nations shall go by your light and kings by the brilliance of your shine. In other words, the light and the brilliant shine of the Jewish people will illuminate and allow for the other nations to go by the light. In other words, that will enlighten their path as well. Because as Isaiah says many times, the purpose of the Jewish people is to influence the rest of the world as well. And this is one more influ um, instance where Isaiah, where Isaiah makes this point. Now, what does it mean that God's light shines upon us? So I mentioned earlier, it means that we have spiritual enlightenment. We also mentioned what Abarbanel says. Abarbanel says that refers to prophecy, which again is spiritual enlightenment. People feel like a certain close intimacy with God and God communicates a knowledge to the people. That's the concept of prophecy. Um, there are other interpretations that say, that say that we are referring to um, the light of God represents God's providence. In other words, if you look at the Torah, especially at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, Devarim, the, the book that where Moshe repeats the Torah, when Moshe predicts the exile, Moshe says that during the time of exile, Anochi haster astir panai bayomahu, I will conceal my countenance, I will hide my face. What does it mean God will hide his face? God doesn't have a face. What it means is that <clears throat> God will conceal his providence. 
So when you look at the past, at, 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 if you look at the, at the history of exile, it does not appear as if God is present and guarding the Jewish people. It looks like God has concealed his presence and has abandoned the Jewish people. And that's where some of the evidence leads to. And that's what many other uh, nations and religions told the Jewish people, we have been abandoned by God. And this is all has been predicted by Moshe. Now, of course, Moshe doesn't say God abandoned us. Moshe says God conceals his countenance, meaning to say the countenance, the providence is there, it's just concealed. And therefore, we were able to su survive as a people for at least 2,000 years, um, despite the fact that it was against all the odds, is because God's providence is, pr is present, God is protecting us, but it's concealed. You can't see it in an open and revealed way, the way we would want to. So some of the commentaries say that when it says the light of God will once again shine upon the Jewish people, we're talking not only about the light of spiritual awareness, not only about the light of prophecy, but also about the light of representing God's, um, God's providence that people would see how God is directing the path of the Jewish people. So that's just another, another, another perspective contrasting to the, back to the time of exile, where it says, God says, I will hide my face. The time of redemption is the time where God reveals his face, reveals his countenance. Right? One of the biggest problems for any uh, believing person is if God indeed exists, why can't I see him? Or why can't I see his influence? Or why can't I see his providence? Why can't I see him protecting me? And the answer is that we're in a time of exile, so it's not always obvious. And sometimes um, you have to look very carefully before you see God's intervention in your life because they come in, it comes in subtle ways. And it looks like natural, so when, when sometimes when the salvation comes, it looks like it was natural, but in reality, it's God's hidden face. But eventually, we'll get the light of God, meaning to say that we will experience the we will experience the light of God in the sense that we will experience the um, open and revealed providence of Hashem. So that's the first point. Now, so if in the first three verses we established that. The, the light of the Jewish people, the spiritual um, light of the Jewish people it are, is going to influence the rest of the Jew, the rest of the world. So now the verse continues and gives us some, uh, what, what gives us, what is the result? What's going to be the product? What's going to be the result of the fact that the nations of the world are going to walk in the light of the Jewish people, right? That was verse three. And the nations shall go by your light and kings by the brilliance of your shine. Meaning to say the light of the Jewish people is going to influence the nations as well. As well. So what happens then? And now we have a beautiful verse. Um, Lift up your eyes all around and see. They all have gathered. They have come to you. Your sons shall come from afar, and your daughters shall be raised on their side. So this is a verse that describes how we, standing in Israel, look around and we see the sons and daughters coming home. Um, there was a Hasidic singer named Avram Fried who wrote a song to these words. And when I was in Israel, in northern Israel, on Svat, every Friday we used to drive down from Svat to Tveria and help people put on tefillin. And it's a beautiful road from Tzvat to Tveria. You go down the hill, you descend down the hill. And we had this song playing in the background where the prophet says, look around, your sons and daughters are going to come back. So it was very uh, poetic. But just thinking about this verse for a minute, who exactly is coming? So one, who, who, who exactly is being at, gathered to come towards you? So one interpretation is your sons and your daughters, meaning the Jewish people are coming back. Another interpretation is that it's a continuation of verse three, meaning to say that um, the nations of the world will come and help bring the, 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 the Jewish people back to Israel. So it's a continuation. It's not, we're not talking about the Jewish people per se returning to Israel. That, has, that we have mentioned in the previous Haftorahs. Here we're talking about how the nations of the world will bring the, help the, bring the Jewish people back, meaning help the Jewish people come back to Israel. And now, here is an interesting verse, verse 5. Then you shall see and be radiant, and your heart shall be startled and become enlarged. For the abundance of the West shall be turned over to you. <clears throat> the wealth of the nations that will come to you. 
So this is an interesting verse. So now that the Jewish people, so again, the first point is that the Jewish people's spiritual light will, will shine and influence the rest of the world. As a result, the rest of the world will turn toward Israel to walk in the light of Israel. According to some interpretations, they will come and bring our, the, Jew, the, the sons and daughters, the Jewish people back to Israel. So what would you expect? You would expect the, the next verse, verse five, to be all about joy and happiness. And that's how the English translation that I just read, um, that's how they translate. Then you shall see and be radiant. But that's not, that's not the way everybody translates it. In Hebrew, the word for seeing, um, the ot or ra'ah, or year, uh, is the same word as the concept of fear and awe. So it could mean it. Then you will see and be radiant, or it could mean then you will be in awe. You will be fear. You will fear and be radiant. And that's probably the the better interpretation because then the verse continues in a, in a specific pattern. Then you will fear and be radiant, and your heart shall be startled, but then become and become enlarged. In other words, it seems like that the Jewish people are not sure how to react to this how to react to this, um, to, this, to this change, where not only are the, Jew, are the Gentiles not oppressing the Jewish people, but they're actually coming to Israel to help the Jewish people to bring back the sons and daughters. So what does that do to the people? So our first reaction is fear. Why are we fear? Why fear? Because we're traumatized. Because we have experienced the trauma of the past, we feel that when the, when the nations gather, they're gathering for war or they're gathering to oppress us. So even though now, they're gathering to help us and support us, but we are still suffering from our past traumas. And that's why our first response is fear. And the second, as the second clause of verse five says, and then we'll be startled. We'll start, everyone's coming. If everyone's coming, it's obviously to attack us because that's our trauma from the exile. But then we realize that in fact, not only are they not coming to harm us, but they're coming to help us. So then from the fear, we become radiant. And then from the state of being startled, we become enlarged. Your heart will, be, will expand. It's an expression of joy. So that just real, um, emphasizes the transformation from the trauma of the past to the joy of, of the future. So that's one inter interesting interpretation. There is another interpretation about this verse. Um, there is a, the first Ashkenazic chief rabbi of Israel was Rabbi Cook. That was his name, very famous uh, rabbi. And he, um, I guess he's the father of religious Zionism. And recently I found out that he was also, um, uh, we also have a connection to him because he was officiated at the, wed at the wedding of my great grandfather in what was then, he was then the chief rabbi of Tel Aviv and Yafo. And my great grandparents were in Israel for a, a short period of time before they came to the United States in the early uh, 1910s. And he officiated at their wedding. In any case, he was a very, a very poetic man and he was a very prolific writer and very famous rabbi. And when they laid the cornerstone, when they, start, when they started building the foundation of the Hebrew university, so the Zionist leaders, this is pre the state of Israel, the Zionist leaders at the time, I believe Dr. Weitzman, who later became the president of Israel, also invited him to speak. They really wanted him to come and speak. And he came to speak at the university, at the, at the ceremony of that. I don't know. I don't think it was the inauguration. I think it was the, 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 the building of the building. The, in other words, setting, beginning to build the, the Hebrew university. And he quoted this verse and he asked this question. He said, why the fear, right? Here you see people are coming to Israel. They're coming. And the verse is very poetic. The abundance of the West shall be turned over to you. And that's really what the Hebrew University represents. We're talking about Western knowledge coming back to Israel. So it's wonderful. Why, why the fear? It should be only joy. And here is what Rabbi Cook said. He said, very interesting. He said, the Jewish response is both fear and joy. In other words, there is a threat. The threat would be that the influence of the West would make us lose our own unique identity. And that's the fear. But then the purpose is that we should be able to benefit from the influence of the nations while also maintain, maintaining our own specific Jewish identity. And that's why we have some degree of fear and some degree of joy because they're both true. And that's the balance that we have to walk or we're called upon to walk 
in the modern world. It's not like the ghetto where we're secluded from the world. We're supposed to influence the world, not only influence the world, but also be influenced from the, from, from the world around us, from the West. That's what he's saying. It's not just that they bring us gold and silver, but it's a metaphor. They're bringing, us all their, all the, they're bringing to us all their unbelievable achievements in the realms of science and philosophy, etc. But the point is that that creates joy, but that also we also then, quote unquote, fear, or we're in awe, we have to make sure that um, we also are able to maintain our own, our own specific identity. So that's the speech of Rabbi Cook when they established the university, I believe, at 1920-something. You can check it out. Okay, now we continue. We're continuing over the theme, uh, in the theme of, <clears throat> of the, the wealth that the nations of the world will bring to the Jewish people as a result of the light of the Jewish people shining over the nations, as we explained, it's the spiritual light. In other words, the, Jew, the nations of the world up to this point are in spiritual darkness, but the light of God shines upon the Jews, and from the Jews it spreads to the rest of the world, because the Jews are doing their job, they're projecting the light of God to the rest of the nations, and as a response, the nations of the world are coming to Israel with, tremendous, with bringing a tremendous amount of wealth, and the next few verses discuss this wealth in great detail. <clears throat> so here we go. Verse six, a multitude of camels shall cover you, the young camels of Midian and Ephah, all of them shall come from Shiva, gold and frankincense shall they carry, and the praises of the Lord they shall report. So in other words, they're coming from all around, they're coming with their gold and with their incense, but what are they doing? It's not just they're coming, but they're coming and they're also singing the praises of the Lord. In other words, they are developing a relationship with Hashem, with God. And then we continue. All the sheep of Kedar, Kedar is Arabia, they knew how to raise sheep back then, um, shall be gathered to you. The rams of Nebaioth shall serve you. They shall be offered up with acceptance upon my altar and I will glor glorify my glorious house. In other words, this represents the Jewish the nations coming with their wealth to Israel and serving God in the temple. They're bringing their animals as offerings in the house of God, at, in the temple. That's seven. <clears throat> and then we continue to eight. Um, who are these that fly like a cloud and like doves to their coats? In other words, we're describing the concept that the people coming back to Israel are coming with tremendous speed, like the, like the clouds, and like doves flying back to their, I don't know how you pronounce it, coats or cots, but they're coming back to their, to their um, what do they call those? They call those the, uh, their home. I forget the word. The nest. So in any case, again, who is this verse referring to? Just like there are other verses in this Torah, it's not exactly clear. It's either referring to the Jewish people coming back, or it's referring to the nations of the world coming to Israel, helping to bring back the Gentile, uh, the, the Jewish people. Um, what's the metaphor of coming back by clouds? So today we know what it means. Today we know it means that they're gonna come on airplanes. That's the speed of airplanes. No, I'm only half kidding. Uh, and back in the day, there were no airplanes. So how do they read this verse throughout, this, throughout the ages that we're gonna come? Who's coming as quick as clouds? So that's a metaphor, say the commentaries, for speed. They're not going to have, they're going to come with great speed. And that's the metaphor of the way clouds travel. Today, it could mean that we come by airplanes as well, I guess. <clears throat> we continue with the theme of bringing the wealth to Jerusalem for the I, 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 for the eyes of I, I, the islands will hope for me and the ships of Tarshish in the beginning to bring your sons from afar, their silver and their gold with them, in the name of the Lord your God, and for the Holy One of Israel, who, for he has glorified you. Again, we're talking about the, the, not only the lands, the, the lands that we mentioned earlier in verse seven, but also the distant islands in, in, that we discuss in verse nine will come by boats and bring your sons from the distance, their silver and gold with them. Who's silver and gold? Again, in this Aftara, it could be referring to the silver of the gold and gold of the Jews, that they'll be able to bring it back to Israel, or it can be referring to the silver and the gold of the nations who are coming back and bringing the Jewish people. 
Now we have something very poetic. Um, verse 10, the foreigners shall build your walls and your kings shall, and their kings shall serve you. For in my wrath, I struck you. And in my grace, have I had mercy on you. So um, the nations of the world are going to come and they're going to help rebuild the walls of your cities or the walls of Jerusalem. So that's very good because we're, we're, that's the symbol of being in the ancient world. The uh, walled city was a sign of might, was a sign of protection. And of course, we have the fast days in our Jewish, in the history and in, in our calendar, the 17th of Tammuz, when the walls of Jerusalem were breached by the Romans and maybe even by the Babylonians. It's not clear, there's a disagreement when the Babylonians breached the walls of Jerusalem in the first temple. But second, we have a fast day when the, when the Romans breached the walls of Jerusalem um, in the second temple, that's the 17th of Tammuz. And what's happening here is that now, instead of breaking our wall, instead of destroying the cities, the nations of the world are going to rebuild. Okay, that's beautiful. But then read the next verse. The next verse is interesting. Just because we have a wall, it's good to have a wall, but if you have to lock your walls at night, if you have to lock the city at night, that means you're afraid of the enemy. So verse 11 reads, and they shall open your gates always day and night. They shall not be closed to bring to you the wealth of nations and their kings in procession. So this is very poetic. We have a wall, the walls are rebuilt, but we can't close the doors even at night. Why can't we close the doors? Number one, we're not afraid of an enemy, but number two, we can't close the doors because there are too many people pushing to come to Jerusalem, to, to our cities, and that's their, and bringing their wealth and bringing their kings to, um, to Israel. So that's beautiful. Now we continue. We continue for the nation, verse 12, for the nation and the kingdom that shall not serve you shall perish and the nations shall be destroyed. In other words, we're talking about the influence of the nations, but what about the nations that are evil, that are not going to be transformed by the light of Israel, by the light of God shining through Israel? So they ultimately will be, will be destroyed. Um, and now we continue with the theme of the nations bringing their wealth to Jerusalem. 13, the glory of the Lebanon shall come to you, box trees, firs, and cypresses together to glorify the place of my sanctuary and the place of my feet I will honor. We're talking about rebuilding the temple with the trees of these various types of trees. Uh, it, 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 the verse begins with Kvod HaLevanon, the glory of Lebanon. In the Bible, we read that Lebanon had um, great cedars, Arze HaLevanon, great cedars. In fact, when King Solomon built the temple, he commissioned trees from um, Lebanon. And that's what these verses, verse 13 is referring to, bringing back um, um, the nations, bringing the trees to rebuild the temple. And <clears throat> we continue. And the children of your oppressors, verse 14, the children of your oppressors shall go to you bent over, and those who despised you shall prostrate themselves at the, at the soles of your feet. And they shall call you the city of the Lord, Zion of the Holy One of Israel. So again, the transformation that the descendants of the people who oppressed us now come and they praise us. And then 15, instead of your being forsaken and hated without a passerby, in other words, we're abandoned, nobody passes by the land, I will make you an everlasting pride, the joy of every nation. So stove adore the joy of every nation. And this is an interesting verse. The commentaries point out that usually what happens when one nation becomes successful. So typically when one nation becomes successful, all the other nations are jealous of that nation and they have a certain animosity to that nation. And what the Torah, what the prophet, what Isaiah is describing here is that despite the fact that the Jewish people spiritual, because of the fact that, this, that, the, that the Jewish people's spiritual light will influence the rest of the world, even though they're coming and they're bringing their wealth to Israel and Israel becomes a powerful nation, that doesn't create feelings of animosity. To the contrary, as the verse says, that God will make us the joy of every generation. Uh, the commentaries understand this to mean that all nations will be happy for the success of the Jewish people because they see themselves at their spiritual purpose as helping the Jews spread their light to the rest of the world. And we continue on the theme, and you shall suck the milk of nations and the breast of kings you shall suck, 
and you shall know that I am the Lord, your Savior, and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. In other words, again, we're getting the we're getting the milk. I'm getting we're getting the 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 uh, flow from the other nations. And verse 17 is where Isaiah describes this. A very interesting description. Instead of the copper, I shall bring gold. Instead of the iron, I, sh I will bring silver. And instead of wood, copper. And instead of the stones, iron. And I will make your officers peace and your rulers righteousness. Okay, so what is this verse telling us? This verse seems to be telling that whatever we need, whenever we go to the mansion, you go to the store and you put it in an order for one material, they're going to give you a better material. So instead of copper, you get gold. Instead of iron, you get silver. Whatever you ask for, you get a, a, you get a, you get a higher form of material. So what is this referring to? So there are two interpretations. One interpretation is, this is Rashi, the standard interpretation, is that um, when the Jewish people uh, were invaded by the nations and their country was looted, so instead of, because of the fact that the nations took away silver from the Jewish people, go, I'm sorry, yeah, but instead, instead of the fact that they took copper, now they will repay it with gold. And because of the fact that they took our iron, they will repay it with silver. So this is an expression of the nations of the world correcting their uh, past destruction, destruction of Israel, and they will repay us not just what they took, but they'll repay us in a greater level. So that's one interpretation. Another interpretation is that <clears throat> this is, again, this represents the fact that the nations of the world are sort of going to come and bring the Jewish people what they need, but it's, this highlights the enthusiasm of the nations of the world to do so. So they actually bring more than what we request, more than what we ask of them. So if we ask them for some uh, copper, they will bring us gold, etc. Now, what happens when a country is inundated with wealth? So now you have to start worrying about justice. You have to start worrying about peace. You have to start worrying about a police force to protect the wealth and make sure people don't steal from each other. So that's the end of verse 17. I will make your officers peace and your rulers righteousness. Typically, if there's a lot of wealth, you have to set up a strong police force. You have to have officers and you have to have rulers to um, protect private property, to protect the possessions of people. Because ultimately, when there's wealth, wealth can create competition. Wealth can create jealousy, right? When everybody has nothing, it's very easy to leave in peace. When some people have more than others, then you need a good police force. Right? You don't want to defund the police too early. When Mashiach comes, we'll be able to defund the police. But I think before then, it's a little bit dangerous. Um, I hope this is not a political statement. I don't mean this. I mean to say that the concept that we must have um, officers to, to, to enforce law and order. But the verse says when Mashiach comes, despite the fact of the great wealth, then we won't need officers. Because what is the officer who will impose who will impose order? Peace. The fact that the people are peaceful, it comes from them. They're not going to need officers. And then your rulers, what are your rulers? Tzedakah. Tzedakah is, here it translates as righteousness or justice, but we won't need the IRS to come and collect the tax and, and give to the poor because what will rule our streets is peace and tzedakah, peace and charity, peace and righteousness. So not only will the wealth come to Israel, but that wealth that comes to Israel will not corrupt us. And that's part of the spiritual um, redemption. Because if it's just a physical redemption, then, then material blessing could be dangerous. Because the first time around when the Jewish people entered Israel and they experienced a tremendous era of, 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 of success and prosperity, but Moshe right away in the Torah already predicts that the prosperity could actually lead people away from God and the prosperity could make people more arrogant. And here, because we're talking about the spiritual light of Hashem will shine upon the people. In other words, the people have, will experience spiritual enlightenment. So the physical wealth that we will experience is not going to corrupt us spiritually. And that's, what, that's the theme of verse 17 and 18. Violence shall no longer be heard in your land, neither robbery nor destruction within your borders, and you shall call salvation your walls and your gates praise. In other words, what's our salvation? What's our gates? What's, what protects us? What protects us is not a security company. What protect, protects us is, is the praise of God. In other words, the people's awareness 
of their position in this world and their purpose in this world, which is to serve God and do goodness and kindness. Okay, now we have a very poetic verse. I'm going to read the verses and then see what the, what, what, what the poetry is saying, what the Kabbalah is saying. There's a lot here, but I'll, let's, let's, let's see if we can do this. Verse 19 and 20. Verse 19. You shall no longer have the sun for light by day and for brightness. The moon shall not give you light, but the Lord shall be to you for an everlasting light and your God for your glory. So we don't need any more. We're not going to need the light of the sun and the light of the moon. Why not? Because we have the light of God. That's what verse 19 seems to be saying. And then as a result of 19, verse 20 continues, continues, your sun shall no longer set, neither shall your moon be gathered in, for the Lord shall be to you for an everlasting light, and the days of your mourning shall be completed. So it seems to be saying that if we don't need the sun and the moon to give us light because we have light from God, then the sun will no longer set and the moon will no longer set. In other words, if it sets or it, or it doesn't, is irrelevant to us because we have the light of Hashem, the everlasting light of Hashem, and that will last forever. So we'll deal, let's first deal with 30, with 20, verse 20, the second one. Your sun shall no longer set, neither shall your moon be gathered in. So what's the sun, what's the moon? So the sun is a metaphor for the light of God. What is the moon? The moon that reflects the light of God that's a metaphor for the prophets. The prophets that try to influence the Jewish people and share the word of God are like the, uh, is like the, are like the moon that reflect the light of Hashem. So what we're saying is up till this point, we had the sun, we had the light of God shine upon Israel. We even had prophets, but the sun set and the moon set. In other words, there were times that we did not experience the light of God and uh, and, uh, and the light of the prophets also, we, the prophecy has been lost. Well, so what verse 20 says is that this is not, the light of the sun and the moon will no longer set because we will have the everlasting light of God. And if we have the everlasting light of God, the days of your mourning, meaning mourning as M-O-U-R, the mourning will be complete and the light of Hashem will last forever. And then it continues because we don't need the moon, because we don't need prophets, because everybody will be a prophet. It doesn't say exact those words, but that's what verse 21 says. And all your, and your people, all of them righteous, shall inherit the land forever. A, 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 a sign of my planting, the work of my hands in which I take glory. So every Jew is the, is, is the, is the work of God's hands through which God takes glory. Going back to verse 19, we'll no longer need the sun for light by day, and for brightness, the moon shall not give you light. So what's happening here? So there's a lot of mysticism in this verse, going back to the Medrash. If you look at the very first day of creation, the verse says that on the first day, God created light. Vayar Elohim Kitov. God saw that it was good, right? So, so first it says that God, God, God created the light. Then it says God saw that the light was good. And he separated the light and the darkness. So the, comment, the Megrush explains that God creates light on the first day of creation, but that light is too intense. And therefore that light is hidden. And instead we're left with a lesser degree of light, which then could be divided to night and day, to light and darkness, the domain of the sun and the moon. But preceding that, when it says God created light, that's a much more intense light that was too intense for this world and had to be hidden. And there's two versions, two interpretations of the Medrash. One says the light is hidden in the Torah, and one says the light is hidden for the righteous in the world to come. So however you explain what this great light would mean, it means that in addition to the natural light produced by the sun and the moon, is a spiritual intense light that was available and accessible in the beginning of creation, but then it was hidden. And verse 19 goes back to that Medrash and talks and, and says, we will no longer need the light of the sun and the moon because we're going to have that intense light from the first day. And that intense light is an intense awareness of God, but ultimately the awareness of God gives us enlightenment in other areas as well.
And finally, we get to the last verse, 25, 22. The smallest shall become a thousand and the least a mighty nation. In other words, even the small number of Jewish people will multiply and become a thousand. And even the least, meaning the weakest, will become a mighty nation. I am the Lord. In its time, I will hasten it. Meaning, when, when is this going to come about? It will come in its time and it will be hastened. What does that mean? In its time, I will hasten it. So the simple interpretation means that once the time of redemption comes, it's going to happen very quickly. Right? We discussed this in the past, that typically we expect dramatic change to, to be a process that takes many years and many decades. But in reality, sometimes dramatic change happens very quickly. And we saw that in the 20th century. We saw that in the beginning of the 21st century, that dramatic change can happen very quickly. We saw that with uh, the fall of Soviet Union. We saw that with the Arab Spring, regardless if you think it's good or bad, it's not the point. The point is that very powerful nations collapse very quickly. So transformation can happen very quickly. So the simple interpretation of this verse is that at the right time, when the time of the redemption comes about, it's going to happen very quickly. Another interpretation is in the Talmud. And the Talmud says there's two clauses here. Ani Hashem, I'm the Lord. Bi'ita. The redemption can come in its proper time, which means in the destined time, which when it was destined to be, or achishena, or I will hasten it. <coughs> and the Talmud says that that depends on the Jewish people. In other words, the era of redemption, when is redemption going to happen? So one approach is it will happen whenever God planned it to happen. Yes, that's, that, that is true. That's the, that's the, that's the first clause, the ita. In the, its proper time, this will come about. But then there's another verse. Then the verse continues, Achishena, God will hasten it. If the people merit, we are able to bring about the redemption quicker than, than, than it was first destined to be. In other words, this is very empowering. We're talking about the Jewish people throughout the suffering of the exile. And they're reading these visions of Isaiah that seems to be talking about a future that's almost too good to be true. And that obviously gives a tremendous amount of hope because people have to have what to hope for. We, would, we wouldn't have hope. We would not be able to overcome the difficulties of the exile. But again, hope could either be passive or active. If I believe something good is going to happen, but it's going to happen whenever it's destined to happen, there's nothing I can do to make it come quicker. So then I have hope. I have optimism. But this hope and optimism makes me passive because there's nothing I can do to bring about this change. There's nothing I I could do to bring about, about this transformation. So this is why when the sages read this verse, they didn't read it. If you want, uh, 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 when the time comes, it's going to happen very quickly. The sages said, no, that's not what it means. It means the redemption will come in its proper time. So that will give us the hope. But we also have the ability to make it come quicker. We have the ability to make it hate, to make it quick and bring it about earlier than it was supposed to be. We can bring the healing and redemption to the world even before the destined time. And therefore, the hope is not a hope that, that creates passivity, but that's a hope that makes us active and makes us seek to bring the world to its perfection. So that is, that's the story in short, just to summarize in general terms, because we, we spoke about every verse individually. But in general terms, what this Haftorah adds to the other Haftorahs is that this Haftorah discusses not just the physical wealth and this physical um, um, rebuilding of the land of Israel, but it's the spiritual light that will shine on Israel, the light of prophecy, the light of spiritual enlightenment. This light will then spread to the rest of the world because that's our purpose is to influence the rest of the world. And as a result, the rest of the world will see their own mission as supporting the Jewish people and they will come to Israel with their wealth to, to build our walls, but our walls are not really to keep people out. The worlds are left open because of the intense desire of people to come and be influenced from the Jewish people. And finally, the last point is that it's up to us to make this happen even quicker than the appropriate, than the, than the prescribed time. There's a prescribed time, that's, this will happen in its right time. But then there's Achi Shena, there is the time for us. We're able to make it sooner, we're able to make it quicker. So that is the story in short. If anybody has any questions or any comments, please share. Otherwise, we look forward to continuing studying together online and in person in good health and have a wonderful day and uh, good to see everybody. Rabbi, one quick question. 